Hello, everyone. My name is Alan Dick, and on behalf of my fellow co-founders, Scott Silverman and Veronica Sonsev, as well as the entire Commerce Next team, I want to welcome you to today's webinar. Today is Wednesday, January 24th, 2024, and our topic this week, Must See TV, How to Use Linear and Streaming TV to Drive Revenue. Before we go any further, I'd like to welcome and thank today's speakers, Rick Egan. He's a VP of Marketing at Bed Bath & Beyond, Ron John Roy, the VP of Strategy at Adore Me, and Angela Voss, the CEO of Marketing Architects. Thanks so much for being with us today. We appreciate you having you here. You may have noticed that we're missing a speaker. Uh, unfortunately, Kendra came down with a bad cold this morning and can no longer join the panel. However, she has given me permission to reference the comments and suggestions she made during our speaker prep call, so at least she'll get some of the benefit of her being here. Uh, moreover, uh, she has very graciously agreed uh, to connect with any attendees via LinkedIn to discuss any questions you may have. So you can drop her a line uh, over at her LinkedIn address. And Kendra, if you're watching, thank you so much for being that generous. I appreciate it. And I certainly hope you feel better soon. Thank you as well to Marketing Architects uh, for sponsoring today's webinar. We couldn't bring these to you without the support of our sponsor partners. It's been a real pleasure working with Angela, and I really appreciate her and her team's help putting this together. I also want to thank the Commerce Next staff, Veronica, Scott, Jill, Maeve, and Robert, who are all off screen helping to make this webinar a success. And of course, as always, thanks most of all to you, the audience, for taking the time to be with us today. We hope to give you a good webinar. Before we go any further, I want to mention that our next webinar takes place next Wednesday, January 31st. The topic, 2024 Digital Retail Forecast, Opportunities, Challenges, and Strategies. Now, this is our look ahead for 2024 and features Sucharita Kodali, the VP and Senior Analyst at Forrester Research. She's going to be presenting a whole slew of new data, including some research we've been doing. After she talks uh, for a while, we'll bring the uh, killer panel on to offer their advice uh, for 2024. Uh, our forecasting webinars are among the highest rated and best attended, so you definitely want to register for this now, and you can see that link in the chat. Now, speaking of things coming up in 2024. You know, it's just never too early to register for our big event, the Commerce Next Growth Show. That's going to be June 11th to 13th in New York City. We do have free registration for leaders at scaled retail and DTC brands. We also have a travel program, which provides up to $1,200 in travel reimbursements in exchange for participating in our one-on-one -on -one meeting program. If you sign up today, you could win a $350 gift card to the New York City restaurant of your choice. Plus, there's an added advantage for our webinar listeners. If you register today, uh, we will enhance your winning prospects by counting your entry twice. This means you get double the chances to win if you register today. You can go to commercenext.com forward slash conference or look in the chat for the link to learn more and apply to attend. Finally, just want to remind you that our YouTube channel now has over 370 videos and covering topics including acquisition, retention, leadership, retail technology, and so much more. And side note, we do have Kendra's uh, CN 2021 IRL conference presentation on how she drove growth uh, in our TV uh, archive. So take a look over there, and you can click on the link in the chat to visit our YouTube channel. Here's today's agenda. Angela Voss, the CEO of Marketing Architects, will show you how to use your linear and streaming TV to drive revenue. After that, we're going to get your take on TV advertising with a couple of poll questions. And finally, we have our expert panel discussion where we'll dive more into strategies and tactics you can use to improve your TV ad game. And of course, we'll be taking your questions. Before we bring Angela, just want to note that uh, we are recording this webinar and we'll make it available by tomorrow. And now let's take a moment to show you where things are. So take a look at those four tabs at the upper right of your screen. That's chat. Q&A, polls, and handouts. Please use the chat tab when you want to communicate with other attendees. Use the Q&A tab when you want to ask the speakers a question. The polls tab is where you can participate in polls and review the results. And the handouts tab is where we have today's presentations and other materials available for you to download. One important thing to remember, you can show your interest in a specific audience question by upvoting it. Now, this really helps uh, me prioritize which questions to present to the panel because in, we, we generally get a lot of questions. I'd like to know which ones are the most important to you, and we'll try to get to as many as we can. And lastly, if you're watching this on replay, please note that the handouts are available by clicking on the highlighted document icon in the video player. And with that, let's, add, let's welcome Angela Voss, the CEO of Marketing Architects, to stage. Angela, how are you doing today? 
Doing very well, Alan. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. I will leave the stage to your capable hands. All right. Well, I'm very excited to dive into how to drive revenue through linear and CTV. Many marketers view TV as a significant opportunity, but this is also a channel that can carry a lot of risk. And so my goal today is just to provide insights on how to pro how to effectively use TV and CTV, not only to reach your consumers and increase brand awareness, but also to generate meaningful revenue for your business as brands are you know, increasingly expected to demonstrate accountability at every stage of the marketing funnel. I'll focus on some strategies that deliver real, real results to the bottom line. Just for background, Marketing Architects is a full service TV agency. Our sole specialization is television, both CTV and linear. And we have a reputation for transforming and revolutionizing traditional TV advertising practices for a broad range of brands with annual revenues of hundreds of millions all the way up to Fortune 500 companies. Uh, with over 25 years in this industry, we have collaborated with clients from various sectors and throughout this period have accumulated a wealth of data on our clients' campaigns and the strategies that have yielded the most significant impact. And recently, we undertook a comprehensive analysis of these results and identified three recurring themes in our clients' most successful TV advertising initiatives. And those are the themes that I'm going to be sharing with you and, and discussing today. So diving right into the first. Um, is lean into reach. TV is the king, the queen of uh, all top of funnel channels. And that comes with immense power and opportunity. And the significance of reach in this channel cannot be overstated. Without it, um, you know, every brand is going to inevitably encounter a performance plateau, right? Which is a challenge where efforts to grow by capturing a larger share of the in-market consumer just starts to yield diminishing returns. And so with sufficient reach, we ensure that our brand remains mentally available for future demand. And we don't overlook potential customers who may have an interest in our product or service, and we just increase our chances of converting more of those prospects into customers. But with the expansion of CTV and its increasingly digital-like targeting capabilities, some advertisers are adopting what we would consider an overly narrow focus in their TV strategies. And this highly targeted approach, um, while it can seem advantageous, can actually represent a significant missed opportunity in terms of broader brand reach and engagement. Uh, CTV does provide unique targeting and, and measurement capabilities, no question. You know, we can retarget website visitors, we can track viewers from the moment they see your advertisement to when they make a purchase. And of course, this approach seems logical, I would say at first glance, you know, why spend resources reaching people who are less likely to become customers. But for many brands, uh, this can be a flawed strategy. And that is because many brands have a broader audience potential than they realize. I'm going to use a B2B brand as an example. They're known for their very niche audiences, and they often focus on highly targeted marketing, you know, aiming solely at business decision makers. Um, so if we think about a company, let's say selling project management software would be targeting an IT decision maker very likely. Traditional B2B marketing strategies would focus exclusively on that group. Yet the reality is that B2B buying decisions usually involve six to 10 people. And over 80% of buyers end up choosing a brand that they were already aware of before they started shopping. So when marketing strategies are too narrowly focused, they really miss the crucial opportunity to influence other key players in that decision making process. And this doesn't mean that you know, targeted advertising on TV isn't necessary. It, it definitely is. But for many brands, the target audience should be broader than initially thought. You know, it, it might be not just the IT decision maker, but also the CFO, maybe even the CEO, potentially, potentially junior members of the IT team. And by embracing a broader reach strategy in their TV advertising, our B2B clients have achieved very impressive growth results. Uh, their campaigns have an average return on ad spend of over seven, and brand awareness has increased by more than 90% on average. 
Moving to our second finding, and this one ties closely to finding number one because we hear a lot of brands come to us wanting to reach those secondary influencers that are outside kind of that niche bullseye target, but they don't have the budget to do it. So here's a headline that should be more obvious, I think, than it is in our in our worlds, but the greatest predictor of TV's success will be driven by the cost to attain it. That is number one, over-targeting or anything else. Cost matters most. And calling a spade a spade, it's no secret that uh, TV has been among the worst offenders, right, for skyscraper high prices. If we consider the extreme example would be the Super Bowl. Um, since the first Super Bowl, the price for an advertisement has skyrocketed by thousands of percentage points, and even in the past two decades has uh, risen by approximately 300%. And when we think about costs and CPM, CTV is sort of a sneaky space where costs are compounded by various tech fees that are just inherent in this ecosystem. We've got SSP fees, ad exchange fees, we have video ad serving fees, um, there's others. And then of course, each additional layer of targeting that leverages third party data increases the overall uh, media costs for brands, which just makes it increasingly difficult to achieve that strong ROI that brands are looking for. But um, we can consider a scenario where the cost of TV advertising isn't as prohibitive as it currently is. You know, if achieving reach could be done efficiently, could TV transform into a performance channel that is both accountable and cost effective? And the answer to that is yes. Um, this year, we undertook a comprehensive audit of our clients' media purchases, analyzing spend as estimated by Kantar, and then looked at reach metrics assessed by both Samba and NPower, Nielsen's NPower. And the findings were quite revealing. Our clients have been able to achieve reach levels on par with some of the most prominent brands in advertising on television. We're talking about brands like Walmart. Um, IBM, Home Depot, and they've done so at roughly half the cost. And so this discovery, you know, significantly changes the narrative around the risk associated with TV advertising. While, you know, a portion of these savings can be attributed to our proprietary media buying tech that we developed um, that sources extreme efficiencies, but there are also some tips that any marketer or media buyer can implement. Firstly, we adopt a strategy that goes beyond restricting our clients' advertising plans to only the largest networks or publishers. We often see brands come to us with failed TV efforts that have focused exclusively on the largest platforms like a Hulu or a Roku or a Disney, um, just neglecting the multitude of other streaming options available and limiting ad buys to just those top networks or publishers can rapidly deplete a marketing budget at very high CPMs. I think additionally, it's important to recognize that Audience viewing habits are far more varied than these top few networks can cater to. Uh, viewing behavior has become increasingly fragmented and maximum efficiency and reach is achievable by exploring a comprehensive range of media options. So we would recommend employing a budget across a diverse media portfolio rather than concentrating it on a few high, high profile platforms. So when considering then that entire spectrum of media options, then the key question is, how do we determine which ones are optimal for your brand? This de decision really begins with, with targeting. Uh, while our goal is not to become excessively targeted, right, we still want to prioritize reach. Um, it's important to recognize that, that targeting is still essential here. Um, start by focusing on a specific definition of your I ideal customer understand where this core audience consumes their TV content. And once that's established, you can gradually broaden your scope to encompass other potential customers and influencers. And this strategy will allow you to maintain that balance between targeted advertising and the necessary reach to capture that wider audience um, at a cost that gives you the best shot at driving that ROI that you're looking for. All right, so let's come back to CTV then because we talked about cost being sneaky in this space. We recommend steering clear of those costly third-party targeting strategies. Um, instead, let's look at options like 
demographic targeting, kind of a staple in the linear world. And even in the CTV space is often a great starting point. It's usually lower cost. We can look to methods like geotargeting, which selects audiences based on zip codes, uh, proves particularly useful for brands with physical retail locations, although it can be effective even for brands that don't have physical retail locations. Uh, contextual targeting is a favorite approach of ours, placing ads within you know, content relevant to your offering. First party, party targeting allows you to engage with individuals already showing interest or some type of suitability based on your own data. And that data can also help create lookalike audiences resembling your existing customers, which we have found to be very effective for new customer acquisition efforts. And then finally, of course, retargeting drives very high conversion rates, um, is extremely valuable to brands, but it does only hit a very narrow group of individuals and so should be paired with other methods. Lastly, it's essential to leverage technology to uh, source media buys at a cost that enables you to meet your performance objectives. These buys do exist, but just given the vast array of options, they can easily be missed without the ha help of tech. Um, you know, fortunately, between AI and just automation in general, uh, there have been advancements to a stage where they can help sift through the plethora of choices and identify those valuable buys for you. Okay, moving to our final finding. And this one's related to creative and your creative message. And that is that we don't need to complicate our messaging with two separate campaigns, the same spot should be used to drive both sales and brand awareness. And to illustrate this point, I'm going to use an example from one of our clients, nuts.com. Uh, they've been around since 1929. So have uh, been around for 90 years plus and have evolved, have evolved into an e-commerce platform offering a lot more than just nuts. Definitely check them out. Uh, when they approached us, their goal was to expand both their brand recognition and grow new customers through television. And so in scenarios like this, it's common to see TV advertisers opt for creating two separate campaigns, one that you know, narrates this compelling brand story and then another that prompts viewers to take action. But we we don't need to do that. The same commercial can effectively fulfill both objectives and actually when done well, will work better together. So by combining brand storytelling with sales activation in one ad, um, we're going to find very effective methods to drive better results. Um, these elements support each other very well. So let's take a look for nuts.com at how this came to light. We'll, we'll go ahead and play their spot. Guys, guys, Nuts.com delivered more fresh snacks to the Johnsons. Delicious cashews, trail mix, dried fruits, sesame sticks. Mm. Okay, here's the plan. We leap from the oak tree, shimmy down the electric wires, over the angry bulldog, parachute into the rose bushes, run past the lawnmower, vault into the kitchen, and remember to avoid that cat. <laughs> Why don't we just order from Nuts.com? But where's the danger in that? Nuts.com, irresistibly fresh, dangerously delicious. Free shipping with your first order. There we go. A fun, compelling, and memorable ad, a little danger uh, with yet incredibly practical and useful information about where to order along with um, an enticing offer for new customers. So this strategy proved to be extremely successful for Nuts.com. Following the launch of their TV campaign with us, they experienced a 100% increase in national aided awareness. Um, those are big numbers for a 90-year-old brand. And 166% increase in new customer acquisition, demonstrating that, you know, integrating these elements together not only works in harmony, but also drives very impactful outcomes. And that is it. That was Fast and Furious. If you're wanting to hear more about how our clients have built successful TV ad campaigns over the years, you can access a full report with way more case studies and data um, through the materials available from the download from the webinar, or you can scan the QR code on screen. Alan, I'm excited to chat more about effective TV strategies with our panel, and I'll turn it back to you. All right. Thank you so much. I love the uh, nuts.com when they're, when they're going across the high tension where you can do the de -de 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 -de. <laughs> Sorry. That just cracks me up endlessly. <laughs> it's like the fifth time I've seen that ad and it still gets me. Yes. All super right. Good. Cool. So, Angela, we'll see you in just a few seconds. Uh, let us move forward. All right. 
So we're going to take a, ask you, the audience here a couple of quick questions. And just a reminder that our webinars are really meant to be interactive now, not just with polling questions that are coming up, but uh, also, and, and actually much more importantly, by being able to take and answer your questions. I'd, I'd like you to think of our panelists as your, um, let's call it your TV advertising personal focus group. Uh, I definitely want you to ask your questions and upvote uh, the audience questions that you want to be put to the panel. We'd, we'd certainly appreciate it. And also for the folks that are just coming on, I see we've got some more people coming in a little bit late. Um, Kendra couldn't make it today uh, from uh, Farmer's Dog. Uh, she sends her regrets, but she uh, took ill. Uh, but we're going to be implementing some of the things she suggested. And uh, she very graciously uh, has offered uh, anyone uh, can ask any follow-up questions with her or contact her on LinkedIn, and she will follow up with you. I thought that was very generous of her to do that. And so with that, let us get to some polling. All right. So let's talk about investment. Question number one, which best describes your current TV advertising investment? None? Invested in linear TV? Maybe you're invested in connected TV. Maybe you're just super advanced and you're investing in both linear and CTV. 46% of you said none. So we have a lot of folks learning about that out here. On the other end of the spectrum, the next highest is 29% and invest in both linear and CTV. We've got 21% of you invested in CTV and only 4% of you invested in linear TV. So that's interesting. We're kind of at both ends. We'll make certain that we uh, address issues at both ends of that spectrum. Let's close that poll. And let us move forward. Question number two. For those of you that are in it, uh, what barriers do you face with testing and scaling TV advertising? You can choose up to three. Is it that the media prices are too high? I mean, you know, who wants to pay more? Is it the cost of creative? How about competitive advantage? Is it just not possible to, to find an advantage here? You don't think you can get it? How about measurement or proving impact? Trying to figure out what that ROI is. Maybe it's finding the right partner. Or if it's something else, let us know in the chat. Kind of not too surprising, but it's interesting. Measuring or proving impact is our early leader at 35%. High media prices, as expected, are up there at 27%. Cost of creative is 24%. Finding the right partner, 9%. And there we have it. So that's interesting. So it's uh, measuring and improving impact is, is the big one, followed by cost. We'll definitely be talking about both of those. All right, let's close that poll. All right, a reminder, our next webinar takes place next Wednesday, January 31st. The topic is 2024 Digital Retail Forecast opportunities, challenges, and strategies. This is our look ahead for 24 and features the one and only Sucharita Kodali, the VP and Senior Analyst at Forrester Research. You definitely don't want to miss what she's going to be talking about. Uh, the link to see that and register for it is over in the chat. If you don't see it there, uh, we will definitely have it uh, in uh, the email you receive when the next um, recording gets done for this. Perfect. And with that in mind, what is your outlook on the prospects? of the retail environment in 2024. Are you A, very optimistic. Ah, oh, it's gonna be a fab year, expecting significant growth and innovation. Are you more cautiously optimistic? Positive, but aware of the potential challenges out there. Neutral, I can't really tell it's gonna be one way or the other. Somewhat concerned, like ah, I got some challenges out there. Or are you very concerned? So very few of you are neutral. Most of you have an opinion. Only 13% of you are neutral. The bulk of you, half of you, are cautiously optimistic. It's kind of where I'm at, to be honest. I'm, I'm with you on that. I think, I think it's going to be better than expected. We do have 29% of you saying that you're somewhat concerned. And only 4% of you are very optimistic or very concerned. So very definitely bounding about the middle with the leaning uh, here with the final vote in at 54% cautiously optimistic. Yeah, I'm with you on that. Excellent. All right, let's close that poll. With that, let's bring up our panel. Rick, Ron John, Angela. Hello, everyone. Hello. How are we all doing Hello. Today? Good. Perfection. All right, why don't we start off with some introductions? Rick, why don't you say hello to our audience? 
Hi, I'm the VP of Marketing at uh, Bed Bath & Beyond, formerly Overstock. So, uh, so, so some interesting things to talk about is uh, we've transitioned from one brand to the next over the past year. Yeah, small brand, small brand. Small yeah. brand. I'm John, yeah, yeah, tiny. Yeah, neither, yeah, we, we, neither, we wanted the small retailer in there. Yeah, many people haven't heard of either. Yeah, I know. It's just such an odd name. Adore me. Talk to me, Ron John. How are you doing? I'm Ron John Roy. I'm the VP of Strategy at Adore Me. We're a direct-to-consumer intimate apparel brand founded in 2011. And uh, we were purchased by Victoria's Secret at the end of last year. So now operating in another well-known retailer. Um, and have a lot to say from the perspective of a digitally native brand, but have done a lot with linear TV and connected TV over the last now nine years. Ooh, you're a grizzled veteran. I can, I can see why we brought you on. <laughs> All right. Well, cool. We'll tell you what, why don't we start with you? Um, you know, the one thing I like to do with these webinars is I kind of try to lay a foundation. Like, what is everyone's basic approach? Do we need to define anything? The definition has been pretty well laid out by Angela. But let's let's talk about, you know, what is your basic approach or theory about TV advertising? Basically, what are you trying to accomplish? Uh, for us? And yes. possibly a bit counter to what Angela had said it towards the beginning of her presentation. It really is still a tool for conversion for us as a digitally native brand. All of our marketing has always been very conversion oriented, measurement oriented is just how we think and how we operate. So even when we pushed into linear TV 2015, 2016 and started experimenting, Everything we did as much as we could from an early on perspective was try to figure out how it would affect a conversion. And, and it's an interesting perspective difference, I think, between brands that grow up like that, even when you move on to a medium like linear, t linear TV, because, you know, you always want to try to fit whatever you're working with into kind of the, the model that you work with on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. Rick, what's, what's your theory? What are, what are you trying to accomplish? You have a slightly different perspective on this. Yeah, I think for 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 us with Bed Bath and Beyond, um, we really needed to um, kind of educate consumers. Uh, you know, as while Bed Bath, you know, did you know obviously was online and mostly brick and mortar. You have a, a fifty year old well known consumer brand, um, brick and mortar that, you know, went through a bankruptcy and a closing of stores. And so we really needed to communicate that while those stores closed and there was a bankruptcy that the the brand and the company was was still here and it was available for them online with and then we also wanted to communicate as well that, you know, we were more, you know, by by being online only that we were more than what they what they had known them for in store. Yeah, you'd have a, I think you mentioned before, there'd be a much larger uh, item footprint. Uh, yes. And that was yet another one of these elements that you need to get across. When, when we spoke with Kendra, I thought it was interesting because she thought of it as um, as a way to disrupt, you know, they're disrupting an existing category, right? They, they just had to get out there and explain why their product was different and unique and why it's important to switch not only to them, but your way of thinking about dog food. And so it was education and category awareness, but yet you still need to inspire urgency. You still need to figure out a way to get that conversion in there. And so all three of you were kind of hitting this from slightly different perspectives. And it was, it was interesting. Rick, let's talk a little bit uh, in some detail about some of the strategies that have been effective uh, for your brand and what challenges you face when implementing them. Okay. Um, so, I mean, I think for, you know, one was we, we really or the big, the big thing we really tried to accomplish was, you know, we certainly wanted to say we were back, um, but a big reason why from a, you know, from a campaign perspective, we, we chose mostly TV supported as well by some out of home. And so Bed, Bed Bath & Beyond was very well known as, you know, a, a, a neighborhood retail store with a big blue sign that you probably drove by a lot. And, you know, and you got a coupon in, you got a big coupon in your blue coupon in your mail every six weeks. And so as part of that um, kind of consumer education, we also wanted to deliver some of those elements in a different way um, to, to really be disruptive and, and catch the consumer's attention that rather than just say you're back and like have them drive down the corner and drive down to their local strip mall and go, wait a minute, this store's closed. <laughs> 
you know, we wanted to say, no, this is different and you're going to get it differently. And so um, we also, we, we did a big element in the, in the commercial spot with the coupon itself um, and really tried to tease that element out that, that the coupon was still available, which then gave us a, a, a clever call to action. So similar to the, the nuts piece, we were both telling the brand story the expansion of the brand story with the beyond we we did that in a yeah. you know we we inserted a bunch of those things and kind of some tiles that that played out so um so we could really you know kind of tease out the beyond portion of it and that there there was a larger inventory footprint but we used some hu humor as well to introduce the coupon and, and let people you know kind of be like i believe it was a bit of like a a mind blown type of, of <laughs> moment with the coupon. And then we did a big QR code that ran for about half the commercial. So. Ah, that's, that's great. Yeah. You got to entertain them. Ron yes. John, uh, you had some uh, interesting um, examples that, that you could share, at least that we were talking about on the call. Would you care to dive into those yeah, for the audience? Of course. So for us, it actually kind of, as I've been listening through the Angela's presentation and, Je and Rick's um, story about their approach, I, it is more clear to me. And when we think about when we went into linear TV, again, we were starting to, we were early in Facebook, starting to realize we need to diversify. And again, this is 2015, 16. But as a startup, very constrained from a cash perspective, from an investment perspective. So everything was about ROI. So actually, we had now our head of data science at the time, a data science intern. Um, he had worked on a project when we first launched Linear TV, basically trying to bring some attribution to Linear TV. So, you know, ad shows in a market. Do we see any uplift within that geographical area? Can we tie it back to any conversion? And, and I, I sometimes wish we had more time on the entertainment side. And I think at our scale now, like we're, we're starting to get there. But, but again, from the beginning, it really was how do we understand ROI at a very granular level with this medium, because otherwise we can't afford to go after it. But but also recognizing kind of, as Angela said, still the reach is greater than anywhere else, finding customers, especially as a brand that was trying to get our name known, mm -hmm. like that dual value of both brand building brand awareness across the entire country. And, and also another thing, our customer base, we're a mass market brand, 40 to $60 price point is very geographically distributed through the country. It's not, you know, in only specific cities or specific regions. So linear TV plays an even more important part on that, but still try to obsess about the measurement side. It's interesting because I know when we were chatting that there's, there's a lot of inference you can be doing. You may not get a direct measurement in certain circumstances, but you can certainly get some indirect ones, like, ge like geographic location being one of them, right? Angela, any thoughts uh, on the concerns of the audience around measuring all of this and how do you how you calculate that? How do you how do you answer that question for your clients? Yeah, I mean, when we talk about measurement, it's it's definitely a it probably is the most important thing that prospects come in trying to understand. Um, you know, if they've not been in television, then they're digitally native and they're used to measuring everything. If they, there, there are also instances in which clients have been in television, but they've really thought of that channel more as top of funnel. Right. So I would say the best practice for our brands is, is just first the recognition that, TV drives full funnel impact. There are so many ways to measure impact. Um, the topic for today was how to drive revenue, right? Not just awareness with TV. And I think it's important to recognize the level of rigor that's essential to do that. Um, we like to think about measurements in three buckets. We have micro impacts, which are impacts that can be seen almost immediately after a TV airing. Think of like the first three to 10 minutes, um, impacts like immediate web lift. Then we look at macro impacts, which would be the impacts that we can detect incrementally in the first couple of months of a campaign. You're seeing traffic composition shifts. You might be bringing in additional models like an MMM, and then the third bucket would be business impacts being three plus months out, which are impacts like 
how is TV shifting your customer lifetime value? How is TV impacting the profitability of other marketing channels like digital? How are we lifting awareness and consideration and preference? And then I would say that we hold the belief that all measurement models are wrong, but some when used together are very useful. Each of our clients has a mix of models in place. I would say probably no less than 10 per client to really triangulate performance impacts. Um, everything from looking at incremental lift against a forecast, uh, heavy up pulsing strategies, AB geo testing. We've got deterministic tracking with QR codes like what Rick did with uh, Bed Bath & Beyond, uh, post-purchase surveys, MMMs making a comeback, so econometric modeling, um, others like ACR-based attribution. Like the list goes on and on. There are a lot of options out there to get to that triangulation of performance. So to Ron John's point, TV isn't just reach. That's the point is... It, it is reach and we should use it as a channel that can drive reach, but the marketers that we work with at least are accountable to that performance. So how do we drive that ROI and get that CPA that they're looking for in the meantime? Yeah. Rick, you look like you're, 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 you got the, I can see the cogs turning there. Is there, is there a nugget of wisdom you wish to share with us, sir? <laughs> no, I think I just agree. I, I'm agreeing with Angela on, you know, kind of of a lot of that because because we do all of those things. I, I'm sure we have at least ten, if not more. Uh, yeah. At. I think <laughs> one of the other things that, that you 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 brought up a few different different things. So one of the things that you know that I I at least will do and kind of you know kind of holding my teams teams accountable accountable and doing it is uh, you know we're buying we're buying linear CTV. We're running things on on YouTube and Meta as well. Mm -hmm. And so so. But it's the same, you know, to, you know, going back to like, we're not doing a different spot for each one. We're doing the same spots. So mm -hmm. you know, going back and, you know, there's things we can look at, you know, on the linear side, there's things we can look at at the CTV side, you know, YouTube and so forth. And so we, we plug all those in um, as well as we do some incrementality testing. We're doing surveys um, and all of those types of things to really triangulate in and then we're you know just in in general we're looking okay is our active customer list growing is you know are we seeing lifts in conversion rate you know from an enterprise standpoint to you know to ultimately we can feel good about you know we can try to measure some of the spots and what do we like and what do we what do we think is less effective but we're also looking at those other things and saying this isn't a standalone campaign that we're going to you know measure in a silo it's going to lift all boats and are we seeing that it's going to lift all boats or not yeah i was watching kendra's uh and this is kendra prasad the vp of marketing over at the farmer's dog i was watching her um presentation from our 2021 show uh, in our in our, our video archive over on YouTube, and I, I thought one of the uh, one of the interesting things she said was, "Look, th and this is to Angela's point. You, you, if you're going to go out and buy an expensive TV spot, and like you, I think Angela, you were Super Bowl, but she was buying with the U.S. Open, and she was doing something that was really clever. She goes, first know your audience, because once you know that, everything follows." Our audience was going to be at the U.S. Open. We bought a couple of very expensive spots. Now, you can just stop there, and what you'll see is, you know, da-da-da, vump, 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 right, in engagement, maybe a sale or two, right? Two weeks after that, it's wasted money. She goes, the way to think about it, the way we're thinking about it, is your audience is at the U.S. Open, expensive, but they're also an ESPN Classic, and they're also over here, and they're also over here, and they're also over here. And so what you're doing is you're planning where that audience is going to be and hitting that same message over again. You're also keeping a reserve budget so you can go in there the day before and buy the cheapest ad slots possible, but you know your audience is going to be there. And I thought, that's just clever. Like you're kind of stacking the, stacking the deck that way. Let me ask you this, and this is what I wanted to ask her. Could you do that? And then could you take it one step further with measurement and go, okay, I know that my audience is primarily in the Northeast for this, or I know there's a good section of it here in the Southwest. Maybe I'll just buy locally there and really pile into it and see if that moves the needle for orders coming out of that area and maybe use that as a proxy, right? Now you can just take that theory even further and, and just kind of get, just get that granular with it and mm -hmm. use that as an extension to say, well, okay, the broader campaign should be resulting in this. Like use that smaller test as a proxy. And I wanted, to, I desperately wanted to ask her that question. So I will ask you that question. Could you do that from a measurement standpoint? 
if, if you're sitting there thinking, I'm going to take a giant bite for one big ad, then I'm going to follow up where I'm going to follow my audience in cheaper ads. Could the, some of those cheaper ads be in specific locations or some other attribute that you could really spend into because it's cheap and learn a lot more about your audience? That's I can jump question. in. Yeah, I'll jump, jump in there. Um, yeah, yeah. Maybe Ron, John, and Rick can play off of it. Absolutely. I mean, we have... Anytime we're starting a, a new TV campaign, we always want to start with a proxy test. And that can take a variety of shapes and forms. But for some of our largest clients that are billion dollar brands, if we were to take a national approach, their testing budget would be outrageous just to get above the baseline. We always want to look for incrementality. And so whether it's a specific area of the country um, or you're doing AB market geo testing, understanding kind of you, you have to have a, a pretty fine tuned approach to understanding what performance would look like if you didn't have television in that market. But it's a great approach because it does provide air cover. You can track those deterministic results, but you also get insights in a shorter, more reduced investment um, realm when you look at things like how does TV impact your digital marketing? What is it doing to your retail stores? What is it potentially even doing to partnerships in local markets? So of course, every business is unique um, in terms of how they're set up and, and where they drive sales through. Is it retail based? Is it e-commerce? But it's, it's a great uh, example of, of a way to look at a more bite-sized approach to building a theory of how TV can drive impact for your business. Mm -hmm. Rick, why don't you have yeah, any thoughts on that? Yeah, just to follow on, um, I mean, for us, Angela brought this up, follow on whether it's through linear TV, but especially for us because platform marketing, Meta, TikTok, Facebook, Instagram are such a big part of our business that trying to bring the attribution between TV to do we see a difference in performance of those same ads geographically where uh, where the linear TV ads are shown. That's something that we put a lot of work into and realizing that, and, and I love to Angela's line, and I think a good webinar is where you ne will never forget a line after Afterwards, that all marketing model predict all marketing prediction models are wrong, but it's just how you put them together that you could start to gain some insights. I think that's what, what it was, uh, but I think that's what for uh, for us that's really the idea that like can linear TV not only find some directly attributable result, but it can also provide uplift to your more dominant channels. Good, Rick. I thought I, no. Okay. Oh. Sorry, yeah, I'm looking at many screens here, and I I, I, I saw yeah. movement there. <laughs> no, I'd say I'm just, I, picking, I'd say, now I'm just harassing you. That's all. Yeah, I'm doing. I, I'd say from testing, um, you know, we're primarily using YouTube and Meta, um, you know, because that, you know, it, it is more measurable. We can we can see things as a you know as a D to C brand. Um, those work pretty well, and then from you know, a linear perspective, we're, we're thinking more about audiences. So we're kind of proving out, it, is, is this ad, is this message, you know, effective? And we're using some of the, those channels, you know, digital channels for that. And then, and then using you, and then take that, and then we'll kind of amplify it through linear and CTV with a focus on audiences. Yeah. I think we've kind of hit the measuring uh, question. If we haven't, audience, please feel free to throw a couple of questions in there for us. We'd love to hear from you. If we're not addressing what you want to hear, uh, please let us know. Uh, but I definitely wanted to touch on measurement. The other big issue for the audience was cost. And, you know, Kendra, you know, was finding a way, you know, she always kept a reserve of cash. You know, X percentage of her marketing budget is always ready to spend for something going on you know, in the next 24 to 72 hours. Um, and I think that's that's smart, right? That is a very good way, if you know your audience, to help drive down average costs. But um, Rick and Ranjan, you guys definitely had different theories on this. Rick, you, you had kind of a big company theory on this. Uh, how do you keep costs down? He asked, knowing the answer. <laughs> um, I believe you told me you went direct to the the big oh yeah, going to, yeah, yeah that, that's right. So we were going. And thanks, thanks for for the cheat sheet there, Alan. I'm <laughs> here, to, here to help, man. <laughs> uh, no, I think what what we're what we look for is is really kind of value adds to supplement yeah. the buy that we're making. So you know, when when we can go on go on a show and 
you know, demonstrate a few products and things like that, we see, you know, kind of large uplift. And then that really supports the the buys that we're making. But, you know, that can that can lead to really kind of an incremental additional, you know, million dollar in spend value that you get for really no cost or very little cost. Mm -hmm. Ranjan, you you made a statement uh, when we were talking. Again, we had done this in in pieces, so the other folks hadn't heard it. I thought you had a a phrase uh, that was good. That that measurement was strategy was the strategy. Can can you elaborate on that? I, I think that was really interesting. Yeah, going back to kind of where we started this conversation, that for us, constantly trying to improve and understand the me the way to measure is is almost part of the entire exercise that when we see an opportunity that feels or is more measurable that that actually plays into kind of the budgetary decision just as much as other factors and we we've even seen this even thinking about like digital out of home or obviously connected tv or as we move into areas that become technically more measurable, even though I actually, Angela, in your presentation, I thought that was pretty interesting around how even connected TV theoretically should be much more efficient, but isn't necessarily, um, it, it, it's the starting point for every conversation around TV for us. And, and I think when you sit around the table, it helps set expectations going forward rather than let's see what happens and then afterwards try to justify it when you're sitting at the table with your CEO, COO, every CFO, and you're saying, here is the approach we're going to take around measurement, it at least, it, it makes all those uh, conversations a lot more predictable and understandable. Yeah, I think Angela would probably violently disagree with you about like really thinking about the technology of it all. It's more random <laughs> is the way you should approach it, absolutely. right, Angela? It's, it's, yeah, it's absolutely. really a pen and paper approach, honestly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I got my abacus. I'm ready to go. Totally. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I think this is just one that rewards diligence and technology and paying attention. You know, I Absolutely. think they all do. I mean, but seriously, all the conversations I've ever heard about this, it's it, you just have to approach this with technology. Um, if you're going to do it at any type of scale, I want to, we have about 10 minutes left. There's a couple of questions. One's come in from the audience. I want to make sure I'm hitting all of the big ones here. So we had a lot of folks that, on this call that have not started yet. And I think the, the big question here is what's the first move, right? For Kendra, it was about establishing metrics for early success. You know, you just don't have time to sit and wait three months or six months to figure out if something's working. Figure out what you're gonna who you're gonna target. Figure out what the metrics are. Hit it and quit it. I just want you guys, you know, Rick. What? How do you? What would you recommend? Where, where does one start? I mean, I I would recommend first. To, first, you have to develop a metric. First, you have to develop a budget and the metrics that you want to hit. And then, then I believe you have to. Then you have to protect that budget. I think the biggest mistake that people can make is. They, they put together a budget and they probably walk away from that too quickly. Um, you're going to have to establish your message with an audience. You know, you, you may need to work through some creative a little bit. Um, you know, what, what you come out with may not quite work. You got to make sure that your, your, your CTAs are in line and that you're, you're seeing the result that you're looking for. So I, I agree with putting together the the KPIs in the playbook. That's a good place to start in setting a budget. But I think, you know, that what I'd encourage is really like you really need to protect that budget and hold on to it and look for both the, you know, direct performance success as well as the kind of secondary performance success that you're going to see kind of in that halo effect of what you're going to do. You've definitely, um, you have definitely touched upon two things I want to come back to, but I'm, I'm going to let Ron John take this one. What would you recommend as a good starting point? Yeah, for us, finding the next edge is always the way I kind of think about this. And I, I like that you called me a grizzled veteran when we're nine <laughs> years into a linear TV. But even for us, again, when we started a direct-to-consumer brand going onto linear and bringing kind of a direct response mindset to the medium gave us an edge and was something that not a lot of others, especially our competitors were doing. So it worked. And then eventually that got saturated. And to me right now, I mean, going back to connected TV, I think 
there's so much opportunity around there, both in terms of kind of the advertising, the, the medium innovation, the way it's bought, where it's available. I, I think there's someone is going to crack the code in new ways and do things that are innovative. And I think it's, that's where newer entrants probably are going to be more nimble and flexible to do that. We hope mm -hmm. we figure it out, but it's it's always easier when you're just starting for the for finding the next big thing. Yeah, it gives you a little more latitude and leeway. Absolutely. Angela, any thoughts on this before we start going to some audience uh, questions? No, I think, um, you know, what's been shared has been good. I would say if I'm trying to not add on and say the same thing, um, understand your variables and the potential that they have to drive success or not. So for example, when we think about creative messaging that you're, you're planning to put into market for your TV test, we should know that that message is effective before we put it into market. And that's possible through predictive pre-testing. If we don't know, and TV doesn't hit our objective, then it's much more difficult to parse out why it didn't work, right? Was the media plan wrong? Yeah. And we want to be able to correct that in the next test. This is not a space to be guessing in. So have an experienced party um, in your test setup so that you're not left with those unanswered questions. I think that's really important. And then I do agree that... Um, you know, many marketers, I think, think they need to put millions into TV and wait many, many months to determine if it's working. And that's just not true. There are impacts that you should see immediately, um, leading indicators of even macro gains that should allow for alignment across your organization on the impact that TV is driving. All right. So I'm going to get into some of these questions. Uh, this is from, and this print is way too small, uh, Greg Fogelsong, he asked this question over on LinkedIn. Greg, thanks for the question. Uh, the question is, when you measured linear and CTV against digital channels using your various tools, how do they generally stack up from an incremental ROAS standpoint? That's a toss-up question. Anyone can fire on that one. I'm looking at you, Ron John. I can jump in there. Uh, See that? I think it was totally voluntary on your part. Totally voluntary, but I'll take that one. I think it is, again, not necessarily trying to find the incrementality of linear and connected TV, but trying to see how it works with their existing platforms and not separating, separating out the two. Because if you're solely, if, if it's kind of like competing one channel against the other, at least for us, I mean, from a pure conversion and revenue standpoint, platforms always going to win. So it's still trying to understand how they work together as opposed to kind of like com having one compete against the other. Mm -hmm. Angela? Yes. Um, I can provide a perspective based on what we hear from our clients. Obviously, we don't see their direct digital campaigns directly, but most of our clients find that their, their TV campaigns perform on par with their customer acquisition performance on Facebook or any other kind of standard standard digital campaign with customer acquisition at the at the heart of the goal. So the goal for us ultimately is um, through some of the tactics I talked about today. You know, we need to make sure that that short term performance in its own right is profitable. And if we can do that, then building that long term demand and awareness is essentially free to them. That's the goal. All right. Rick is giving me the nod of yes, so I will take you off the hook and not call on you to repeat what the others have said. Well done. All right. Let's keep going with these questions. Uh, Matthew Larmore, uh, question, do you utilize smaller non-related networks or national local networks for pricing? And how do you measure the impact of those networks? Who wants that one? Going I can once. jump in. Do it. Okay. Do it. Um, can you repeat it again? I, I heard sure. the local feed question, yep. but what was the first one? Do, do you utilize smaller non-related networks or national local networks for pricing? And how do you measure the impact of those networks? Yeah. So um, I think what they're meaning is is more, I don't, I don't know what they mean by unrelated but or non-related, but smaller, small to mid-sized long tail cable networks and local feeds, great way to lower pricing. Um, the trick is... The measurement because we're not just out to find low cost spots and so there's a variety of methods um 
a direct attribution model can be effective depending on the size of those airings, but that's something you need to be watching for is, is it enough to get above the baseline? But additionally, we've got methods like QR codes. We still have campaigns that run 800 numbers for like insurance and things like that. So there are other proxy methods that you can use um, that will give you the impact of that campaign or those airings uh, that you can then apply across the rest of the campaign. All right. All right. Anyone else want to bite on that apple or are we going to move to the next one? Once, twice. Ah, we're moving and grooving here. We don't wait. We don't wait. Betty Rodriguez is asking, if you don't have a benchmark to work with or case studies that match your company's profile, what metrics would you use to measure success in incorporating this type of outreach strategy? I think for us, it's whatever is already driving your conversations and whatever is central to kind of how you evaluate your success already and trying to like, you know, bring TV into that world. Because again, if it get for us, you know, CVR was in the North Star from an early uh, conversion rate was our North Star from a very early time. So it just made the conversations easier. So I think, I mean, especially if you're starting out or early stage, bringing completely new vocabulary into your marketing conversations, it makes everything just a little more difficult, especially if you're the one trying to sell it internally. So the more you can kind of bring it into the way you already speak, the better. Yeah, I, I, to add to that, I would also say probably doing a brand list study, um, even if it was a very simple thing, like looking just at Google Trends. You, you mm -hmm. could look as simply as that, you, you would see performance results relatively quickly. Um, but you know, if you, if you haven't been in it, then you, you should see a lot of brand lift and uh, that should tell you if you're going the right way. I agree. I would echo that. Um, I think, you know, working with a partner, they'll help you establish what those baselines are. If you don't have those specific, I need this CAC or this ROAS, um, a learning agenda to help us get there is a is a great way to start you know what ultimately what is the business trying to do what is the what are the growth objectives that we're being held to and then when we think about uh short-term sales versus long-term brand awareness where do you currently exist so to rick's point get a viewpoint on you versus your competitors in terms of brand awareness um and and share you know ga or your your traffic data with an agency or, or partner that you're going to use for that to establish a baseline of where we're at today. And then we're just building theories. Okay. If we were to spend, you know, $50,000 and get X in return, would that be a good win for us? And um, sometimes it takes a little bit of time to go, we're going to build this learning agenda and we're going to find not only what works for the company, but what works from a media perspective, from a creative perspective. And over time, that long-term strategy just starts to take shape. All right. Well, we have just gone through an hour very, very quickly. And so uh, with that, we are at the end of the webinar. Angela, Rick, Ranjan, thank you so much for taking your time out and, and, and spending it with us. Angela, that was a great presentation. Thank you so much for putting your time and effort into making that one good. To our audience, thank you for joining us today. My name is Alan Dick. I'm one of the co-founders of Commerce Next. On behalf of the entire team, thank you for being here. And don't forget to join us next week, same time on the 31st, we take our look ahead for 2024. With that, we are done. Thank you very much. Have a great week. Take care, everyone.